Good evening and welcome to the all new Legal Roundtable Viewpoint. I'm Shaniqua Gray. Here on The Viewpoint, my guests and I share our views on a full range of local, state and national current events. Tonight, we'll be talking about same-sex marriage, an issue currently before the U.S. Supreme Court. Is it legal? Let's find out. Later on in the show, we'll be talking about the recent teen rape convictions in Steubenville, Ohio. We'll be talking about the impact of social media on juvenile delinquency, as well as the impact of rape culture on teens, particularly young males. And it's all going on right here, right now, on the Legal Roundtable Viewpoint. If you're a lawyer and you would like to be a guest on the Legal Roundtable TV show, call Shaniqua Gray at 225-772-1819 or email to the Legal Roundtable at Herzog.com. Roundtable Viewpoint. In this segment, we're talking about same-sex marriage as this issue is currently before the United States Supreme Court. And talking about these issues today, we have Professor Herbert Brown. He's an assistant professor of legal analysis and writing and also teaches constitutional law as well as several other courses at Southern University Law Center. He has conducted extensive scholarly research and has made scholarly presentations and has publications in the area of lesbian gay, bisexual, and transgender rights. We also have with us Mr. Lloyd Benson. Mr. Benson is a community leader who is the founder and mentor of the David Paul Learning Institute. He's a member of the University of Phoenix faculty and leader of the University of Phoenix Alumni Association, institutional head of Boy Scouts of, of America, commission member of BRIC, and also chief financial officer of World Link of Churches and Ministry. Welcome both of you all to the Legal Roundtable Viewpoint. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Obviously, as you all know, the U.S. Supreme Court is currently addressing this issue of the constitutionality of same-sex marriage, and I want to talk about some of these issues. And I'll start with you, Professor Brown, since you're a constitutional law professor. Is this, do, do gays have this right to marry under the Constitution? Well, when we're talking about the Constitution, we're mainly talking about the 14th Amendment. Mm -hmm. And under the 14th Amendment, they have two bases upon which to state a claim that they have a constitutional right to uh, be recognized as same-sex couples engaged in marriage. Um, the first avenue that they can do so is under equal protection clause, just meaning that if you have two sets of people and you're treating them uh, differently, you have to have a justification for treating them differently. And the other is that there's a fundamental right under the Substantive Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment, just saying that certain rights are so protected by your privacy that the court, uh, that the states shouldn't infringe upon those rights unless they have a exceedingly justified justification for doing so. And I know that, that the U.S. Supreme Court has held that marriage is a fundamental right, and, um, and I know that they have utilized that analysis in even determining that, you know, you could have interracial marriages um, in, in the Loving case. Um, but I guess, as you said, they have to have some significant reason for that. And I mean, are you finding that there is any particular reason? Are, we, is, are they even articulating a particular reason for this classification? Well, they are arti articulating plenty of reasons for it, but the courts are saying that these are not legitimate or not significant justifications for denying these, per these persons the right to engage in this behavior, such as marriage. Right. Now, I know that one of the issues that they're talking about, which I think people are finding a little unusual, is this whole question about whether or not it's really about procreation and if marriage is really about, you know, the ability to procreate and if that's the case, since same-sex couples can't, then there is no, you don't have the necessity. What do you think about that, Mr. Benson, um, about that argument? Is that sufficient? Uh, I, I don't agree with that. It's not just uh, solely about procreation. Um, I, I base my principles um, solely on uh, the Bible, mm -hmm. uh, being a uh, Christian man. Uh, I believe the Bible is the Constitution that we have to live by as Christians. Uh, so uh, I believe the Bible speaks about marriage. It speaks about family and uh, and the specific needs and what takes place in the family atmosphere. I believe, you know, you in order for one person to uh, do their job that they were created to do, then each, each person has to play their role, being a mother and a father. Uh, I believe that the mother plays that nurturing role 
as much as I love my daughter, I love my son, I could never play, take the place of that motherly love. Uh, and, the, and the opposite, uh, as much as my, my, my wife, she has to discipline our children from time to time, she could never take the place of me being a man in their life. So uh, I believe there's more uh, implications, more things that, um, um, you know, cause the need for uh, a family as traditionally defined as a man and a woman uh, in, a, in a marriage. Okay, you raise a couple of good issues that I want to talk about and one of those issues is I know you're talking about the traditional roles and, and that has been stated quite a bit but we know that there has been uh, really a lot of quite a deviation from those traditional roles today. I mean when we're talking about 40, 50 percent of marriages ending in divorce, you know, over 50 percent of children now born outside of wedlock. Have we lost those traditional roles anyway, whether or not we allow same-sex marriage? That comes as a result of desensitized. We've been desensitized, uh, I believe, through uh, media, uh, through our social media outlets, uh, even with the, the shows that are now become the most popular, uh, the things that we once despised, we rush home to get to and watch e every, every evening, extramarital relationships. Now we find ourselves, now we're rooting for the, the person that's fell in love with the married man, or we're rooting for uh, that, that same sex couple to think. And I think those things came through uh, the result of uh, how we're exposed to information. Uh, my, my mother, my father, uh, my grandparents, they weren't exposed to these things. Uh, like we're exposed to, and even children uh, in, the, in the cartoons that they watch, although they're animated, uh, these shows carry a certain undertone, a message uh, that children are now, uh, they're not even really valuing uh, the role of even men in the house or, or you know. Let me, let me just ask you this, though. Um, you know, you said that, you, that your position is primarily rooted in the Bible, and, and we know that at least as far as the U.S. Supreme Court is concerned, they're not going to really look at that aspect. So. Do you feel like there are other arguments that other outside of religion that supports not allowing same-sex marriage? I would say, uh, as far as the, the legal perspective, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I, I would, wouldn't want to give my opinion on that. Um, mm -hmm. I, don't, yeah. I don't think I know enough about the Constitution and yeah. those laws. Uh, but I would say, uh, to me, to, in, in my opinion, uh, I just have to go off of uh, those biblical principles. Okay. Now, uh, Professor Brown, I have a question for you. S civil unions, that had always been something that had been sort of suggested or offered, you know, to give same-sex couples a lot of the rights that are, that are being missed by not being able to be a married couple. Is that sufficient to allow these civil unions, this civil contract, is that sufficient to comply with this fundamental right to marry, in your opinion? I don't think that's sufficient to comply with this fundamental right to marry because, the, once again, the, the fundamental right is to marriage. And I also think that you create two separate tracks. You create two things that you say are equal, but in the minds of other people, they know it is not equal. So we have another case of separate but equal. So I don't think that civil unions or domestic partnerships are sufficient in a, in a case of when the fundamental right is marriage. The Supreme Court has said in the Loving case, as you mentioned before, that marriage is a fundamental right. So the idea of marriage must be the fundamental right, not this separate thing that we don't know what to define it as and we don't know what the legal principles are going to be for it. Let's just call it civil Something. unions and domestic partnerships. I know, and even in California, one of the courts in California said that, you know, just having the union is specifically denying them of that right to marry and is there for that very purpose. One of the things that has garnered a lot of attention about this issue is that it seems that it's a generational divide more so than a political or, or, you know, a party issue, that younger people are more likely to support same-sex marriage as opposed to older people, as you indicated, people who grew up in a different time, a different era seeming to be more against this. And to what do you attribute that being more of a generational issue? Uh, I would say young people or, or the, the generation, um, there is uh, less opportunity for them to, I think it's more of a, a social identity type uh, of, of situation. Uh, I feel like um, it's, it's more of a conformity. Uh, they, I think they know 
idealistically what it should be, but I think I don't think anyone right now wants to be the antagonist because there's so many uh, uh, major figures that are supporting uh, this direction. But uh, I really believe uh, that you know people they know the generation knows, but it's more so of a conformity to what's taking place and what mainstream is doing versus uh, what they know to be true. Exactly. And it's I would like to comment on that. Yes. I would think I would take the opposite position. I think mm -hmm. that it's not so much conformity I think it's more so they've realized that it doesn't matter mm -hmm. they've realized that it's their friends mm -hmm. it's their brothers and sisters yeah. it's their cousins mm -hmm. it's their uh, co-workers and they realize you were my co-worker before you were my sister before you were my brother before it doesn't matter mm -hmm. so I think it's more so of it it's just the extra thing that doesn't matter it doesn't paint you in a different picture I don't think there's this conformity thing at all it's just that it doesn't make a difference in the person that you are at heart and I'm glad we've had this this discussion I'm glad we've had two people who really feel strongly about these positions but that's all we have time for in this segment and US Supreme Court will be addressing this issue should they get to the substantive issues because we know there are some procedural issues that may prevent them from even addressing this but we should get a decision by June of this year that's that's all we have time for in this segment of the Legal Roundtable Viewpoint. Stay with us. We've got more of the Legal Roundtable in just a moment. If you're a lawyer and you would like to be a guest on the Legal Roundtable TV show, call Shaniqua Gray at 225-772-1819 or email to the Legal Roundtable at Herzog.com. Welcome back to the all new Legal Roundtable Viewpoint. In this segment, we're talking about the recent teen rape convictions in Steubenville, Ohio. And in this segment, we're focusing on the impact of social media on juvenile delinquency. And my guests this evening are includes the reigning Miss Black Louisiana USA, Ms. Shante Rice. She's an educator at a Title IV high school, and her platform as Miss Black Louisiana USA pumps, focuses on the professional and moral development of primarily African-American girls from low income and single parent homes. She's actively involved with various organizations and programs working directly with teens. We also have with us this evening Mr. Murphy Bell Jr. He's an attorney and partner in the firm Jackson Bell Law Firm, and he specializes in all types of litigation, including criminal defense. And I'm very pleased to have our guests here this evening. Welcome to the Legal Roundtable Viewpoint. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, as you all know, there were two teenagers recently convicted of rape in Steubenville, Ohio, 16, 17-year-old, and this was the result of their conduct that occurred back in August of 2012. And uh, they were basically caught in their conduct based on their social media activity. They began tweeting what they were doing. They were posting photographs on Instagram. They were texting each other. And basically, not only did it lead to them being caught, but also the prosecution used it in their defense against them. And because of that, it, I thought it raised two issues that I wanted to cover here on the show. One is that in some instances you have teenagers whose conduct directly results in criminal activity based on their social media use, and in other instances, otherwise criminal conduct, they kind of exploit it based on social media. So I want to talk about that. And as we go into our questions, I'll start with you, Ms. Rice, but I just want to begin with a couple of facts that um, according to the Pew Research Center, 93% of teens have access to internet, 55% of online teens use social media websites, and 75% have cell phones. And I know that you are a high school educator. What has your experience been with teenagers and their social media use? Um, I have noticed a lot of bullying using social networks, such as um, I may post a picture of myself, someone would take the picture, um, they'll put derogatory comments on it and then pass it around to all their friends. So maybe for an example, um, I take a picture, I'm smiling, and then someone writes, um, she's stupid or she's ugly, and then they pass it around as a form of bullying and everyone else posts a picture. 
things of that nature. Now, um, as a high school teacher, have you all had to adopt new policies to help address social media conduct with kids? Because I know even as a law professor, we have students who sometimes forget to turn their phones off. You know, they're texting in class sometimes. I know that cell phones can be used to even cheat, and I can imagine it's only worse at a high school level. So what has your experience been with that? We do have um, policies in place that restrict cell phone usage, but mm -hmm. you can't you can't follow the kids everywhere. Right. And um, I have noticed that students do try to use their phones in class and mm -hmm. um, text messages, but I do believe that the um, the schools are a little slow on adapting laws to actually catch up because we have a policy that doesn't allow faculty members to become friends with the students on Facebook, mm -hmm. but that's not Instagram. That's not Twitter, and there's other you know social networks out there that that you still can interact because it just specifies just a certain you know social network. Right. Well, uh, now, Mr. Bell, you're a criminal defense attorney. I'm sure you've seen just about everything, but I just want to talk about a couple of crimes that we have here that their conduct on Facebook and other social media websites can directly result in criminal activity. And I don't know that a lot of parents are aware of that. Um, there are cyberbullying that you just referred to based on some of them transmitting these text messages or other communications. There's possible cyber stalking that um, teenagers could be involved in based on their social media posts. Online impersonation, which is a new crime that just um, was enacted in the last legislative session where it's illegal to impersonate another actual person by setting up a profile and things of that nature. And one that has really gotten a lot of attention is this sexting. And we know minors have really been involved in transmitting either um, text messages with sexual content and even nudity of themselves. And obviously this law was designed to kind of help prevent them from facing felony charges for the distribution or possession of child pornography. So it really was designed to kind of help them out. What do you think about the strides that we're making, I guess, in the legislature with addressing these crimes? I think, you know, Shaniqua, I think it's always after the fact. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's a law in computers, Moore's Law, which says that processor speed doubles every 18 months. Mm -hmm. And what that means now is we have very powerful computers mm -hmm. in our hands and not just us it's our children right not just high school kids middle school kids mm -hmm. and so you know we live in this cycle of, of, of instant gratification in terms right. of news where news stations encourage people to be uh, to, to send things into the news right and so what you had in Steubenville obviously was a situation where it wasn't just these kids it was just all the kids around everybody had a phone right. whereas before they would have had to call or text somebody uh, to say this is what's happening. Mm -hmm. Everybody just takes a picture or video now and instantly it's on the internet. Mm -hmm. And so if you're inebriated, what have you, you, well, you don't know until you see it the next day or until somebody says, you know, there's pictures of you on on Facebook or Instagram, and that's the other thing. You can't keep up with what's going to be the, the, the latest thing. Right, and that's exactly what happened. I mean, this this poor victim in that case, she was completely, un she was unconscious and unaware of what was going on, but it was based on the social media activity that led to her finding out what had gone on that night. And as you indicated, you have all of these witnesses who were there to testify at the trial, and ultimately all of those text messages, all of those tweets, they were using hashtag, like dead and you know drunk girl and all those things that ultimately led to the the prosecution and conviction of um, of this young man. Do you think that people are aware of this and that we're doing enough to make sure parents and teens are aware of, of the possible serious consequences that can result? I think that we can probably do better. Mm -hmm. I mean obviously the big thing a few years ago as soon as Facebook came out and that type of thing is you don't want to people to know where you are and so mm -hmm. kids today they know not to let people outside of their small little network in right. terms of uh, who's going to be their friend or who's mm -hmm. going to be uh, hooked to their account. Okay. The problem is you can't control that when you, other people are taking pictures of you. Exactly. And then they add your name to it. Mm -hmm. And another thing that's going to happen in Steubenville, they're going to now go after the other kids who are taking pictures. Exactly. And uh, we have a similar law in Louisiana, video voyeurism, right. where, you know, uh, it's illegal to take pictures of things of that nature. Exactly. And there are so many different issues on this, and I wish we could get into more of them because, you know, different states are doing some different things to try to help make sure people are aware. But that's all we have time for in this segment. Stay with us.
If you're a lawyer and you would like to be a guest on the Legal Roundtable TV show, call Shaniqua Gray at 225-772-1819 or email to the Legal Roundtable at Herzog.com. the Legal Roundtable Viewpoint, we're continuing our discussion of the recent teen rape convictions in Steubenville, Ohio. In the last segment, we were focusing on the impact of social media on juvenile delinquency, and in this segment, we're focusing on the impact of rape culture on teens, particularly young men. And our guests are Professor Christopher Tyson. He's an attorney and assistant professor of law at LSU Paul M. Bear Law Center. He's actively involved in the community, serving as a mentor and role model to young men through various organizations and programs, including having formerly worked as a prison educator. He's published extensively in his field and is currently working as a men on a memoir of experiences as a mentor to several young men. And we also have Ms. Afi Patterson. She's also an attorney practicing both domestic and international criminal law. She has extensively studied and researched the treatment of rape in legal systems and the stigma attached to a rape victim in countries around the world while working as a visiting attorney with the International Justice Project in Newark, New Jersey. She's also the founder of the Lace Institute, an organization dedicated to mentoring and the social development of young girls. Welcome both of you to the Legal Roundtable Viewpoint. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you all for being here. I would like to start with you, Professor Tyson. I know that you've worked extensively with young boys as a mentor and a prison educator and so forth. And in your opinion, is there a rape culture either in America or in any segment of society? What are some of your theories on that as we take a look further into this Steubenville teen rape case? Well, thanks for having me. Uh, yes, I believe there is a such thing as a, a rape culture, and many people have written about this, uh, essentially talking about the ways in which we've objectified women uh, and that we've uh, constructed masculinity in terms that suggest that men are hypersexual uh, and beyond some point uh, have no control over their sexuality and so uh, we have to begin to re-educate our young people women and men uh, about uh, responsibility, uh, about the choices that they make, and about the power they do have to control themselves and their bodies in, in various situations. And it seems like you're doing that to a certain extent by going into the prisons and so forth and, and speaking with these young men. And uh, I know that, at least to some degree, there is this idea that in prisons in and of itself, there's this idea of a rape culture. And I know that you've dealt with um, some young men in prisons. I'm not sure of the length of time that they have, they've been there. But what do you think that they experienced coming back trying to re-enter society, having experienced that? Well, I think with regards to rape, and I think with regards to the experiences of young men, uh, be they incarcerated uh, young men returning to society, be they young men already in society, they're all affected by the same images, the same cultural messages, many of which uh, suggest to men that uh, when, when, when sexual assault occurs, that our first inquiry is to, uh, is, is what did the young lady do to bring this upon herself? Was there something she did that somehow gave this young man uh, a pass or, or, or somehow um, uh, changed his actions or affected his actions in a way that absolves him of any responsibility? And I'm glad you say that because that was one of the major issues in this particular case, in this Steubenville teen rape case, you know, because we had a victim there who was so intoxicated, she had passed out, she was unable to remember anything that had gone on, and of course it was only after through the social media activity, which we talked about in the previous segment, that she even learned what had happened. But there's been a lot of criticism in this case, uh, Ms. Patterson, about the amount of emphasis that has been put on the offenders, these young men, what, you know, what they're losing in their life. What about the victim? You've worked with victims and you have studied the impact that this, the stigma that this has on a, on a rape victim. What does she potentially face come after this incident? Uh, there are a lot of things that, that happen to rape victims. Um, first and foremost, ostracism by her community. Uh, that's a big issue. You know, she can't do the things that she normally did. Um, I mean, you saw in the reports that people were threatening her. Uh, they were threatening her safety. They were um, 
accusing her of doing all types of wrongs and bringing this upon herself. So you feel guilt, you feel shame, um, it affects your sex life, uh, it affects your sexuality. Uh, I mean, there are just innumerable, innumerable excuse me, things that occur as a result of a rape. And that's why a, a lot of times it goes unreported because you don't want the backlash from the community. You don't want the, the shame from the community. And you know, it's interesting you would say that because there have been at least two additional teenagers who have been arrested for threatening um, the victim in that case following their, their convictions. And it seems to me almost as though that in and of itself is exemplary of a rape culture because the victim is essentially being blamed for the conduct of those young men and people are calling her different types of names because she was intoxicated, which is somewhat of what you were referring to by saying that she brought it on herself based on her conduct. And so, I mean, what do you think it is about other people, and I'll say teenagers in that case, that would lead, lead them to blame a victim for this type of conduct that has happened to them? Well, I mean, you don't lose autonomy over your body just because you're intoxicated or just because you've done a drug or uh, just because you're incapable somehow of saying no. You have not consented to a touching of your body. Um, I've read reports where um, neighbors and friends have said that she used to dress improperly. She used to um, wear short skirts. She used to wear low-cut shirts, and, and that was improper, and perhaps that, you know, people were led on by her. You know, because somebody dresses outside of the bounds of what you think is acceptable or what you think is moral, does that mean that she loses autonomy over her body? Does that mean that you can touch her, you can penetrate her? I don't think so. And I think this is our evidence of a rape culture. Uh, it, it shows up in our immediate visceral reactions to these instances of sexual violence. What are the first questions we asked? Well, well, well what was she wearing? Mm -hmm. What was she doing? Our emphasis is first upon the victim because we teach women to be defensive. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the, the, the idea that she would end up in this situation means that she must not have been acting defensively, uh, that she must not have been aware of this potential risk by implicitly these men who can't control themselves if they're put in certain situations. Mm -hmm. That is a rape culture. Exactly. That is a culture that, that excuses men mm -hmm. and places all of the burden on women. Exactly, and it, it condones rape and it perpetuates mm -hmm. it. And what do you think about the, the young men? Obviously they're 16, 17 year old, one has a year, one has two years to do in this juvenile facility. Can they ever have a normal life? What do you think of the long term, the long term impact of being a, a a convicted rapist that would have on a young man at this at this point devastating uh, devastating it's a stigma that uh, those men will likely deal with uh, for the rest of their lives and I hope that they can seek help from their family and, and, and supporters uh, but we don't begin mourning what these young men have lost until something tragic like this happens. Exactly. We don't say anything of the young men who participate uh, in, in the videos and the other instances of a culture that objectifies women, that, that creates this environment where uh, 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 sex is, is somehow expected or demanded from women. And we see that in a number of ways. And we need to begin being concerned about those young men, uh, their welfare, uh, when, when that happens as opposed to after this well, tragedy. Thank you all very much for your comments. This is a very important discussion and I hope we can continue this um, as necessary. And so I thank you all for coming. So thank you for joining us with this edition of the Legal Roundtable Viewpoint. Continue to join us for upcoming editions of the Legal Roundtable Viewpoint. Until next time, I'm Shanique Wilgray.